All right, welcome today to How Your Spending Can Change the World. We have a lot of different components of um, intentional spending to cover and how you can manage that along with your, uh, your values and your resources. So we're gonna go ahead and talk about uh, that today. My name is Andrea Pellegrini and I run the Student Money Management Center out of University Bursar for the entire University of Illinois system. And I am joined today by my colleagues, Emily and Ramya. Emily, do you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, my name's Emily Harmon and I am the finances educator for the East Central Illinois part of my world. And I serve Champaign Ford, Iroquois and Vermilion counties. Thank you so much for joining us today, Emily. Ramya, do you wanna introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Ramya Vaidnath and I'm a grad student at Geese College of Business. I also work with Andrea at the SMMC of the University Bursar. Thank you so much, Ramya. So we're going to be talking a lot today about different things. But before we get started, we want to uh, acknowledge that collectively the Get Savvy team represents organizations across the state of Illinois which rest on the land of multiple native nations, including ancestral lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankasha, Wea, Miami, Muscoutin, Ottawa, Selk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasha nations. And we have a responsibility to acknowledge these native nations and to work with them as we move forward as a vibrant and inclusive society. So earlier, before we actually started the recording, I mentioned that we're going to be using the chat function a lot today. So if you can put in the chat where you are logging in from today, what state or county within Illinois, that would be really fabulous. So we can get an idea of where people are logging in from. Lots of Kankakee and Champaign, Chicago, New Mexico, California. I love it when we have a lot of people in Illinois, but also across the United States. Looks like we got Wisconsin, and North Dakota, all over the place. Keep those coming. We like to know where you're logging in from, but we also have a lot to cover. Um, we are also going to be using polls a little bit more than usual today. So we're gonna launch a poll and we're gonna have you uh, respond to that. Da, 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 da. There we go. It takes me a little bit to get those started sometimes. So hopefully you can see some of the demographics questions that we have. We kind of want to get an idea of um, the, the people that are joining us today and what things look like. This also helps um, extension to maintain funding these and, and get an understanding of the types of people that they are reaching with some of their outreach. And obviously, the University of Illinois system is partnering with Extension, which is our outreach arm for the university. So we want to make sure to get as much data as we can to help them continue to receive funding and we can provide free education like what we're doing today. So it looks like we have lots of responses. There's a big range, lots of diverse audience members, it looks like. So really appreciate that. I'll just share that real quickly so everyone else can see we have a lot of diversity in our audience today. And I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing results. And we're going to talk about our learning objectives today. So we want to define what conscious consumerism is, since that's a main theme of what we're going to be talking about, as well as some of the related terminology to that. We're also going to explore how values motivate spending decisions because it's not just about knowledge. There's a lot of behaviors involved in financial management, obviously. Uh, we're going to illustrate some methods of comparison shopping that considers themes surrounding conscious consumerism and your values. We're also going to be talking about ways to understand the importance of researching companies to support or invest with when it comes to your financial decisions and how to identify opportunities to modify spending choices to align more with your values. So we'll be talking a lot about that today. We also want to acknowledge that good financial management doesn't always mean spending less. Usually that's a theme in some of our outreach or whenever you go to financial wellness or budgeting seminars. So we want to acknowledge that that's not always the case. It doesn't only mean spending less. Sometimes it means 
being more intentional with how you spend your dollars and making sure that it aligns with what is most important to you. And I'm going to hand it over to Emily to talk about some of the definitions related to conscious consumerism. Thanks, Andrea. So like Andrea said, I'm going to be talking about what conscious consumerism is and some things related to it. So we have power in the way that we donate, vote, spend, or don't spend our money. This can paint a picture of what our own personal values are. But there are also factors behind those choices that affect our consumer activities. So on the screen, you'll see a pretty straightforward definition, definition from Jocelyn Nugent on what conscious consumerism is. She says that this is a movement whereby consumers vote with their dollars by buying ethical products, avoiding unethical companies, or not purchasing at all. So we also want to acknowledge that we'll be talking through several examples today, and not all values or choices will be represented in our examples. But that, that still means that you, your own values are valid and that your choices and that the choices that we all have access to as consumers are not all the same in all situation, geographic locations or systems. So not all, the, not all values are the same for each person or situation. People can value different things in the same situation. Everybody has their own opinion on what their value is. Each person and situation is unique. On the screen, we have a pretty long list of values and you may identify some of your own values that you have. So this list is not exhaustive, but it's a pretty good, it gives you a pretty good idea for, an ex for example purposes, what people may value. So for my own personal example, I value self-discipline in the sense of I really try to be conscious of what I'm spending my money on. But I recognize the value of self-indulgence, and that usually happens on a Friday or Saturday morning when I get myself especially coffee from somewhere. So that's what I value. I like self-indulgence. I like coffee. So there you go. Another example could be that you care about having authority, but only in group settings, or you value excitement in your life, but only in moderation. That values impact us in so many ways, and sometimes we don't even realize that every decision that we make probably stems from your values. And I see it means already put in the chat that um, a worksheet from Winona State University, and this has some more values on it that help that can help you reflect on your own values. And then what's also nice about this worksheet is it explains different values, and it also has activities for you to think through the reasoning behind why you value certain things. So starting out with another chat question, if you feel comfortable with this, I would like for you to put in the chat what you think your own top three to five values are right now. So if you want to go ahead and put that in the chat, or you can just think about it, it's completely up to you. I see some rolling in, family, independence, autonomy. Mm -hmm. Like for me, I said, I value, I, I value self-indulgence, but only, only, when, only when buying coffee. But or I can value self-discipline. So there's some different things that you can value. And, and the reason I'm having people put this in the chat is just so we can see that people value different things. So stability and health. Yeah, and referring back to the value sheet. Thank you for doing that. You're welcome. Yeah, and I see I'm rolling in. Freedom, respect, and kindness. Absolutely. Thank you guys for sharing and keep them coming in and we'll and I'll look at them. So we're talking about how our values can influence our personal choices. And guess what? <laughs> They're going to influence our money choices too. So uh, we're sharing some money value statements on the screen. And this is not an exhaustive list, just, just for example purposes of why someone might think money is important. So money is important for family life or money is important in case of emergencies, all of those things. And then one of my colleagues is going to put a link in the chat, thank you, of, of a blog post that one of my fellow finance educators wrote where she talks about her own values and how they impact the way that she, the way that she spends. So if you want to read further, you can go ahead and do that there. So then as we go through all the different stages in life from childhood to adult, 
our values can change and they're expected to change. Things that can influence these changes are factors like new information, relationships, experiences. They all can influence what we value and our priorities. It's important to understand where your values come from so they can help you reassess what's most important for you right now. So prioritizing what's important for you right now, what value are you going to prioritize? And then if you're looking at the timeline on the screen, it gives a really good example of how somebody's money value can change over their, over their lives as they get older. So I want you all to take a second and think about what are some of the earliest memories that you have with money? So I just want you to think about these things. How have these memories shaped your money values today? How do those memories impact your habits around spending or saving? So think about that and I'm gonna come back to it in a second. So for my own personal example, I grew up in a big family. I was one of six, so a big family. Money was always tight. So our parents really instilled in us the value of financial security. We try to be very wise with our money. As I've gotten older, I have formed my own money values I, because I've gone through these stages of life. Currently, I am in my early career and I have a new family. So I'm looking at money as more holistically and how money is important to sustain my family. How can the money that I bring in help support my family? So thinking back to that question I asked you a little bit early, earlier about your money memories. This can be described as your money story. Your relationship with money has changed over your lifespan and it will continue to change. And I want to point out that just because you grew up valuing certain things and it served you well in the past, like how my parents instilled in me the value of financial security. And while it is important, I now look at it a different way. And I don't, you don't need to maintain a money value that you had in, in the past. Even though it served you well back then, you made changes in your life now and you have to do what works best for you. You are the author of your own money story. So if you've been a follower of our Get Savvy series, you've known that we've talked about money scripts in the past. These are unconscious beliefs about money, according to Tad and Brad or Ted and Brad Plants. We won't dive super deep into these today, but it's important to explain it, it, explain how it affects our outlooks on money. How we view and manage money has a lot to do with our money scripts. These scripts come from a typical these these scripts were formed typically during our childhood and drive our financial behaviors throughout life. So there are four different types of money scripts, and you can see those on the screen in a short description along with each. So you're looking at the money avoiders, money worshiper, money status, and money vigilance. And then a meme I already put in the chat, but if you would like to learn what your own money scripts are, you can complete the Klontz's on the Klontz's website, their version of the digital inventory, which is kind of like a quiz. And then you can see what type of money script you are. And then if you wanna learn more about different money scripts, or what, if you wanna learn more about what money scripts are, you can go on the Klontz's website or you can watch one of our past Get Savvy series, Budget Hacks, or a session from Illinois Extension's Let's Talk Money series, Who Are You With Money? And now I'm gonna hand it over to Andrea. Thank you so much, Emily. So I'm gonna talk, we've been talking about values and our money stories and how our experiences and what we prioritize in our lives impact our spending decisions. And all of that is kind of representative of our identity. And so the Merriam-Webster definition uh, of identity is the set of values or the set of qualities and beliefs that make uh, one person or a group different from another. Um, and, and that's usually illustrated through our behaviors. That's how it manifests. Um, we're all super diverse people and we come from different backgrounds. Uh, we have different relationships and we already illustrated that we value different things. Obviously there was a lot of variance in, in the chat. There were some themes, right? When we were talking about what we value right now, um, a lot of family came up, a lot of independence um, and valuing natural resources, right? But there's there's differences in it. In, the priority that we place to those things. Um, there's also a difference in how aware we are of different parts of our identity at different times. So for example, 
Um, this this uh, pie chart up here is not a super inclusive visual of my personal identity, but it gives you a little bit of an idea of how I view myself and my relationship with others. So for right now, I'm most aware of my role as an educator, that part of my identity, because I'm currently teaching, right? So it makes sense that I would be most aware of that part of my identity right now. Um, however, there are different elements of my identity that I might be more aware of in other situations or when I'm making certain financial decisions. So that can influence how I spend or save money. For instance, when I'm thinking about uh, my role as a spouse, I am sometimes more inclined to spend money on gifts or experiences to share with my partner. With that same vein, if I'm thinking about the future and my, my future with my husband, I might be thinking about what kinds of savings behaviors I need to account for in my monthly budget or my yearly contributions to um, retirement. So those also impact how we make financial decisions. Um, we're linking a worksheet on the social identity wheel from University of Michigan in the chat if you wanted to kind of reflect on what your own identity is and the different elements of your identity since that can impact your spending priorities as well as your habits and choices. So that's kind of another theme of what we're talking about today. Awareness is the key part of controlling, changing, or even just accepting what your financial choices are. So being reflective and thinking about what your identity is and your values are, are really important to um, making sure that you are practicing conscious consumerism and identifying what habits work well for you and what you might want to change. So some people might call conscious consumerism, especially when it comes to spending or investing, ethical shopping or ethical spending um, or ethical investing. And this usually revolves around whether the mission and actions of the company that you're choosing to spend your money with aligns with your own values and what you would consider ethical. Um, there are tons of different rating systems out there that and, and lists on the internet that can give you some direction on where to look for ethical companies to support within these different industries. Like we have energy and money or finance, fashion, technology, home furnishings, um, all kinds of different industries exist and the, the ethics of those companies within those industries can vary. And so that becomes a little bit overwhelming when you're starting to think about um, how to vet your sources and, and vet how these people are aligning with your ethical concerns, right? So it's important that you do your research on these different companies that you want to support and look at the criteria that uh, they may be considering or using to divine what an ethical company is or an ethical organization is, especially if you're using one of these um, certifications that might be out there for certain ethical companies or ethical organizations. So that's something to consider when you're looking to support uh, companies within these different industries. Something that you, you might not have thought about um, that might be able to help with building awareness around your financial habits and your motivations and your overall money story is practicing mindfulness. So this can be a kind of valuable skill to leverage when you're making purchases or planning for the future or just accepting your relationship with money rather than feeling shame around it. So money shame is often something that comes up when you look into mindfulness for uh, money management is healing from shame. So there's a few resources that we'll talk about throughout the rest of this webinar related to mindfulness and money that may help you when you're thinking about practicing conscious consumerism. Um, I would also like to point out that unfortunately, there are a lot of different definitions and measurements for mindfulness in research and obviously being part of a research institution, we wanna acknowledge that. And that makes it kind of difficult to determine all the benefits of mindfulness, but it is used in a lot of different applications and that can be helpful for 
drawing awareness specifically around our money habits and accepting what we may view as as money mistakes. So that's kind of how we are approaching the mindfulness practice in uh, money management from this perspective. So I spoke about money shame on the previous slide a little bit, and this exists in a lot of us. Um, many of us have had money shame, regardless of our socioeconomic status or background. And the situations that may cause money shame or may result in money shame could include things like you used up your inheritance within a super short amount of time, or maybe you uh, lost a home to foreclosure. Um, maybe it was something simple, like you didn't understand uh, all of the features around a basic financial service. And so you feel shame around that. Um, but mindfulness, practicing mindfulness offers an opportunity to heal from this. And it's important to, to know that we all change, we all mis make mistakes, and we all can grow from those mistakes. So that's one aspect that we want to highlight. And I'm going to hand it back over to Emily to talk about how we're aligning values with our consumer behaviors. Yeah, thanks, Andrea. So I'm going to start us out with another chat question. I love audience interaction. So I want to ask, um, have you ever changed any of your habits to support a cause you care about? So I'll say that again. So have you ever changed any of your habits to support a cause you care about? So you can put your answer, it's a poll question, sorry about that. Um, so you can go ahead and answer yes, no, or unsure. And it's completely voluntary and it's anonymous. Um, and then we're going to share the results and talk about it. And I see I'm coming in. Oh. Okay, and we're sharing the results now, I think. So it looks like 69% of us said that you have, 12% said no, and 19% said unsure. So some of us that have said yes are unsure. So let's go through what um, some things that you might've done to change a habit based on a cause that you supported. So for me, my, my parents always said, turn off the water whenever you're brushing your teeth. Maybe they were saying that to save money or they could have been saying that to help conserve water. Um, or it could be something like making the choice to spend your money at a local grocer to support your local community. These are just some examples that I want to share to signify if you change, if you're unsure or if you don't know if you changed a habit based on to support a cause that you care about. So then going on to identifying your consumer priorities, James Frick, he was a fundraiser and administrator at Notre Dame, and he gives a pretty good quote on what on um, describing consumer priorities. So he says, don't tell me where your priorities are, show me where you spend your money and I'll tell you what they are. This statement is so profound to me because when you spend your money, you can illustrate to others what your own money values are or what your priorities are. Therefore elaborating on your money story or telling or maybe indirectly telling people what your priorities are. So then talking about causes you may care about, there's so many causes out there and we can support them in all the ways, you know? And there's so many things to, to consider when making those consumer choices. So on the screen, you'll see that we have a few different causes and different ways that you can support these causes. But of course, like I said, there's so many things that we care about and we wanna support. And that while it may not be on the screen, you can still know it's still valid. So, Looking if you care about the environment, you can try to see if that company or business has zero waste or if they're considered a green business. Um, if you were wanting to support, support human rights, looking to see if they have fair trade or if it's a black or woman owned business. And then looking at animal, animal rights, you can see if any of the products that they use were developed without animal testing. Or if you're wanting to help support your local community, you can shop at local farmers markets or local businesses. And then there's also, there's also power in not using your dollars. So that's when you're refraining from spending. And we'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide. So on the next slide, we have, what, we have this comparison chart and it looks like we're looking at buying a hoodie. So 
trying to keep track of all the things, like I said, can be very daunting. And for this example, looking at the hooded sweatshirt, there's a lot of things can, that, to consider that's even beyond the price. So is it is this hooded sweatshirt from a small business? Is it a local business? Is it a sustainable business? And when when looking at this chart, if the consumer is valuing those three things, then there's not an obvious winner according to it's kind of spark, it's kind of spread out. So to me, there's not an obvious winner of what type of hoodie that they're going to buy from. And I want to point this out because this is real in life as well. Sometimes we're limited on what we can buy because of the choices that are available to us, right? That's where the power of choosing to not spend comes in. This can be why people choose, this can explain why people choose to boycott certain products, services, or organizations. And then SMART goals gets, I know Get Savvy has done this in the past. So when you decide what your money values are, you may want to make goals to reflect your own money values. And then we know from research that people are more likely to achieve their goals if they have them written down. And so we encourage you to use the SMART goal method when writing your goals. If you, and, and that's a good step in the right direction if you just write it down. That's like the biggest challenge, right? So SMART stands for specific, measurable, agreed upon, realistic, and timely. So being specific, you want to try to be as precise as possible about your goal and using detail when writing it. Being measurable, that just simply means how, you, how can you track your progress? With money, it can be pretty easy because you can say, I want to save $50 or whatever dollar amount you want to say, or the, or the goal can be a task related to money, of course. It doesn't have to be getting to that certain dollar amount. And then agreed upon, is thinking about and considering if there are any other people associated with your goal. So if you're working with your spouse or a family member or a friend, making sure you include them to, to make sure everybody's on the same page. And then going into realistic, it's making sure that you can actually, when you actually create the goal, that you can actually achieve it in the time frame that you've given yourself and considering your resources and income. Is it realistic? And then the last part is of the SMART goal is the timely part. So this is giving yourself a due date or multiple due dates to reach that goal. And I like what Andrea said, organize my tax documents to file is often one of my January to February money goals, right? You wanna do it early. Sometimes you fall behind that and that's just life, but that's funny. Thanks, Andrea. And then, so earlier in the presentation, I talked about different ways that you can support all the causes you may care about. You may have, whenever I was going through that slide, you may have even thought about situations you encountered in the past where you thought the choices you were making were aligning with your values, only to realize that it maybe, only to realize later, maybe it wasn't necessarily true. Andrea touched on this a little bit earlier, but research is a great way to avoid mistakenly supporting things that you don't agree with. And then recognizing that doing the research, it can be overwhelming because it's trying to find all the things and making sure you're making those informed decisions. And then sometimes you could feel guilty because you thought you were supporting a company that aligned with your values and then it didn't. I, I want to point out that mistakes happen and that's a part of life. Mistakes are a part of life. Try doing your due diligence and researching before you buy. Having knowledge beforehand can give you the tools to make the best decisions for, you li for your life and that align with your goals. So how do we actually do our due diligence and our social responsibility? When we look at financial services, we can look them up on the Security and Exchange Commission, the Federal Trade Commission, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, or your state licensing sites. When researching charities, look them up on the Federal Trade Commission. Businesses are generally a little bit harder to research and a way to counteract this is to find what their business mission and values are. Reflect on those values and how they align with your own. And then you can also research who or what they support and how they donate their dollars. And once again, reflect how that aligns with your values. And then putting a little disclaimer out there for when you start researching potential companies you may want to support. There are organizations that claim to represent certain values to appeal to customers. However, they may, they may not be, there may not be an actual vetting process. So once again, 
vet the companies and businesses that you are supporting to see if the values align with yours. And then this is going to be a chat question. So I want you, I want to take a moment to ask everybody if you have ever made the decision to stop spending money somewhere and what was that reason? So put, you can put it in the chat or you can think about it. It's whatever you feel comfortable with. And this was a little bit more thought provoking. It's not necessarily a, a yes or no if you want to exchange or if you want to explain. So I see some rolling in. So bad customer service, um, environmental damage, unethical treatment of employees, customer service. Yeah, where a company donates their money. I talked about that. Who are they, like I talked about in the last slide, who are they supporting? Mm -hmm. What the business stands for. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you all for sharing. And for those that are, if you're still thinking about it, you can put it in the chat and I'll go back and read it later. And then to kind of go along with that, I'm going to launch a poll and ask, it should be launching. There it goes. Have you found a company that you wanted to support and they ended up not being transparent with their disclosure about how their values could align with your own? So you can choose yes, no, or unsure. And then I'm going to share the results in a few moments and we'll talk about it. Okay. I'm going to have a few more seconds. Okay, can we go ahead and share? Okay, so we should be seeing the results on the screen. So it looks like 48% of people have, 19% 19 of people are, are have said no, and then 32% of people are unsure. So I want to share a personal experience of what happened to me. I I, I was supporting a company. I thought I was supporting a good company. I was buying things from this company. And then I did some further digging after, after buying, you know, and then once I did, once I did my own research, I, I learned that things didn't appear as great as what they, what was advertised or what the, I thought it was. So I made my own mistake and I've moved on from it. But I've learned from it and I took action to rectify it. So power in not spending or reallocating your money to somewhere else. So I just want to point that out that it, it, it can happen and just take action to rectify it. And going back to mindfulness. So Andrea briefly touched on this a little earlier on ways to cope with money shame, but I want to touch on how mindfulness can be used to stop a behavior or habit that we want to kick. So since we're talking about mindfulness, I wanna take this opportunity to just take a second to breathe. So we're gonna breathe in and out. So let's all take a deep breath in and out. Okay, I feel like I had to do that since we're talking about mindfulness, right? So I hope that, I hope that made you feel better. And then we'll get on to the benefits of mindfulness with finances here. So when practicing mindfulness, it can help reduce financial stress it can help reduce panic spending or FOMO shopping, the fear of missing out, which I know I'm responsible for. I have FOMO when I'm missing out on stuff. And then it can help you appreciate what you have in the current moment or during an experience that you've paid for. So like if you're going to the aquarium, you paid to go to the aquarium, practicing mindfulness can help you stay in that moment and appreciate that you're here and getting to experience that. And then it can help you prepare for difficult money conversations like estate planning or anything else that might be difficult for you. And it also helps you rationalize in high stress decision making situations. What, what's important is, is to find a mindfulness technique that works for you because there's so many out there and apply that when you're feeling overwhelmed and then you can experience these benefits. And now over to Andrea. Thank you so much, Emily. So. Um, we're going to be talking about investment or sustainable um, investing for your values. So in thinking about that, I want you to put in the chat, when you think about ethical investing or sustainable investing, what are some of the things that come to mind? I think this, this one might be a little more thought-provoking, so... 
ethical investing has a, a very broad application, especially when you think about the different securities that are available to us and the um, way that we define investing. So um, eco-friendly packaging, yep, sustainable companies, company protects natural resources, shopping at companies that try to be sustainable and treat their employees well. All right. I'm surprised I haven't seen any like clean energy investment um, or refraining from investing in certain companies, right? So we'll move on to talk more about ethical investment concepts. So there are a lot of different concepts to consider when it comes to ethical investing. Uh, divesting, we'll talk about a little bit more, but basically that is um, selling off assets or securities that you no longer need or do not align with your values anymore, or you weren't aware it was part of your portfolio because you didn't actively manage your portfolio. And then it comes to, uh, to light that you are investing in a company that you don't really support. So divesting from that is the act getting rid of that asset. Um, socially responsible investing is sometimes called SRI or sustainable, responsible, and impact investing. And that is related to ESG or environmental, social, and corporate governance concepts, which we'll talk about a little more in depth. It's easy to um, confuse both SRI and ESG investing. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, there are different investment products that are listed by cause. So for instance, if you want to um, invest in clean energy, there are indexes or ETFs or mutual funds that might be specific to supporting clean energy causes or human rights causes or um, supporting development in certain countries. So there are a lot of different elements there to consider. And then there's also government funded investments. So you may not have the assets to be able to like actively invest, but we all live in a society and there are investments through our local governments or our state governments that we can try to influence how those funds are allocated. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. So like I said, when you divest from something, you basically are disposing or selling off an asset. You may decide that you want to take any coal investments out of your portfolio so you can free up that money for other things that you care about, particularly if you are in favor of clean energy or um, companies that support um, uh, initiatives to stop climate change or those kinds of things. So that's how divesting can be a strategy in your um, ethical investing portfolio. Um, the other thing that I talked about was SRI or socially responsible investing. And this is an investment discipline that considers ESG or the environmental, social, and corporate governance criteria of a company to generate long-term competitive financial returns and positive societal impact. So there are a lot of different elements of this. For example, if you're thinking about the environmental components of a company or organization, you may be looking at water use and conservation, how they um, support green building or smart growth in some of their infrastructure. Maybe you look at how they're managing pollution or toxics through their processes. Um, when it comes to the social aspect of, of SRI or ESG um, criteria, you're looking at human rights, maybe diversity and anti-bias issues, looking at how they are providing benefits to their employees and their labor relations, as well as workplace safety. And there's a bunch of other elements to consider. And corporate governance has more specifically to do with how the um, leadership of an organization is structured. Maybe they look at uh, the executive compensation and how that differs compared to the lowest paid employees. Maybe you look at board diversity, making sure that they are inclusive in their board members. Um, maybe they look at uh, 
anti-corruption policies and how they handle corruption within an organization, those are all elements of uh, SRI um, investing or ESG criteria. So there's been a lot of research recently on ESG and SRI uh, investing. So um, the SIF Foundation uh, or Sustainable and Impact Investing Forum uh, did a study in 2022 asking money managers what the leading environmental, social, and corporate governance criteria were for certain assets. And the top five um, criteria were climate change and carbon emissions, military or weapon support, uh, tobacco, fossil fuel divestment, and anti-corruption. So those were elements that were considered in the asset allocation by money managers. This is not uh, research done on independent investors. It's by people that manage large portfolios. So that's why you see like $3.45 trillion in assets for climate change and carbon emissions criteria. So we link that in the chat. Thank you, Amin. So you can get a better idea of what those criteria mean. And when you're thinking about sustainable investing, it's more of a buzzword now, or you see it more in the media because it's grown in popularity in the last few years. As you can see from this chart between 1995 and 2022, the number of total assets in billions that have ESG incorporation or uh, criteria included in those companies or assets has grown exponentially, especially since like 2012. Um, so that's important to Think about there's more options now to support sustainable and ethical investing than there was in 1995 or in 2010. So that makes it a little bit easier to engage in investment strategies that support societal change. All right. So um, one thing that is interesting, Harvard did a Harvard Law School Forum did a study and and saw that higher ESG criteria is also associated with higher performance and lower volatility of investments over a longer period of time. And again, this is correlation. This is not a causation. So some of the possible reasons for this correlation is that there is a decreased amount of risks related to mistakes and um, operational changes, for example, because more of those companies or organizations are paying attention to the environmental impacts of their um, processes, whether they're issues with their um, plants or the way that they handle their um, assets and those kinds of things. Uh, additionally, there's increased operational efficiency, which can decrease costs and make things more stable over the long term, which obviously creates more long-term value. So that's an interesting um, element of, of the Harvard Law School form study that we wanted to highlight regarding ESG investments. Um, investing is, is really hot right now, and there are a lot of new trends that you might have participated in or heard about in the media that we want to touch on a little bit. For example, some people have gotten into meme stocks, which are stocks that are made popular through social media. If you listen to our investing risks and rewards webinar, or um, we did a, a memes and money webinar earlier this year as well, we talked a lot about GameStop, which was the first meme stock that you might have heard of. Um, and, and we don't want to say that you should not buy meme stocks, but you should be thinking about why you're buying a particular stock when you're investing. Does the company align with your values? Are you only buying it because you think it will give you a good return? Is there that FOMO or fear of missing out element? And what are the risks involved with investing in that stock? And are you willing to take those risks, for example? <clears throat> Excuse me. So with crypto and NFTs, 
Um, those are becoming a lot more popular over the past few years. And it's important to understand that most cryptocurrencies as of right now require a significant amount of energy to be mined or supported. And there are changes being made to the way that like the, the underlying technology or blockchain is supported for these types of securities or assets, but not all of them are created equally. So it's important to know if the blockchain technology underlying the crypto or NFT or other digital asset that may not exist yet, but may in the future, um, to know how that black blockchain technology that uh, is underlying those things works in order to make sure that any amount you contribute to those digital assets is aligning with your values, particularly if you care about energy costs and where energy is coming from, because it's, it's kind of uh, controversial right now. So knowing what you're getting into is very important when it comes to crypto and NFTs and anything that relies on blockchain technology. All right, so, and then short selling, is an investment strategy where you are betting on the failure of a company. So when you're thinking about your approach to investing and how you want to support the market, does betting on the failure of a company align with your values or who you are as a, a investor? So thinking about those and ethics related to investment trends and how engaging those investment trends may or may not align with your values is very important when it comes to conscious consumerism and ethical investing. All right, so just a review, when you're thinking about ethical investing or sustainable investing, there are a few things you wanna consider. So what parts of the social responsible investing criteria or approach matter to you? We talked about the environmental, social, and corporate governments criteria, which elements of that are most important to you. Uh, you want to keep in mind your specific investment goal. Usually people are investing for the long term related to retirement. So if your goal is to build wealth, then you want to keep that in mind, not just take advantage of opportunities because it, it aligns with your, your values. You also want to think about long-term wealth. Um, you also want to think about diversification, which we talked more about in our invest in, investing risks and rewards webinar, uh, as well as what the costs are. And again, we can't stress this enough. It's important to do your research to make sure that you're aligning your behaviors with your values. Um, and things can change. So it's really important to stay informed, especially with some of the investment trends that are popular through social media or um, other very quickly changing aspects. Legislation is changing a lot regarding investment. So staying informed in that area can really help you understand what your risks are and how to um, mitigate risks that may pop up. And then it's, it's also important to be willing to change your investment or financial services companies if they are no longer aligning with your values as well. It's not just the act of um, investing itself. So keep all those things in mind when it comes to ethical investing. Um, and then just briefly with the government funded investments, maybe you don't feel like you have the personal capital to invest large amounts in the causes that you care about, your voice still has power in these situations. So you can talk to your state treasurer or government representatives about where funds like the state pension fund is allocated. Um, and you can advocate for changes that align more with what you care about as a voter. So we dropped a few opportunities for Illinois residents in the chat. So you can take advantage of that as well. All right, so I'm gonna hand it over to Ramya to talk about ways of putting conscious consumerism into practice. Thank you, Andrea. Let's now talk about some of the ways of putting conscious consumerism into practice. First, you need to be aware of your values, identity, and recognize if you're going through money shame or guilt. You can also try to identify the influencing factors such as access you have to resources. Lastly, you can include some thoughtful actions like donating to causes you care about or boycotting purchases from specific companies. 
what i do consciously is to buy things like honey from local home ground businesses um where they avoid using a lot of plastic some mindfulness techniques like relaxation include the breath take conscious breaths slow and even body relaxation is systematically relax your body begin at your feet relax them and let go of tension move way up the body internal awareness is thinking mind and feeling body and then external awareness includes awareness of what's going on around you living in the present moment allows you to really hear someone for example you are meeting with a financial advisor or attending a personal finance webinar it also includes awareness of your spaces and living in the present you can mindfully manage money by following these practices start off your morning unplugged set mental directions focus on your breath for 10 to 15 minutes early in your day be kind to yourself when your mind wanders mindfulness gives you the tools to you need to acknowledge the item then come back to work you need to do or your long term financial goals be consistent practice is the key visualize your goals uh, visualize your intents create budgets for a particular period and create awareness of your spending over to andrea now thank you ramya so we we focused a lot on ethical spending during today's webinar and how to be intentional with your purchasing decisions um through practicing mindfulness and some of the strategies that we talked about. But we also want to acknowledge that there are some consumer behaviors that are correlated with more serious issues that practicing mindfulness alone will not solve. So for example, impulse spending is often associated with a lack of self-regulatory resources that govern self-control. And there's a lot of research on this. Um, but the reasons that those resources are not there or might be depleted may not be associated with your habits or choices. It could be situational, like you're tired, you might have had too much caffeine, or maybe you're experiencing poverty, or the environment you're in supports impulse spending. Um, or it could be related to a biological condition. And so making sure that underlying biological condition is, is addressed can help you reduce impulse spending if that's your goal. So in, in either case, be it biological or situational, um, addressing what is actually depleting those self-regulatory resources is the most important part of making any change in your consumer habits. So that could mean seeking mental health treatment or counseling or modifying your habits to reduce cognitive fatigue, which makes wise decision making very difficult. For instance, um, automating your uh, response to op impulse opportunities to spend. It might be the automatic is no. Um, and so there might be a few internal rules that you set to decide when you'll make spending decisions and when you'll default to no or i uh, will deal with that later and if it comes the opportunity comes back then we'll reconsider it um, another thing that can be an unhealthy consumer behavior is regret purchases they happen to everyone at one point or another um, they may be related to impulse control or they may not be related to impulse control. For example, um, Emily talked earlier about um, how she was supporting a company and then found out that that company didn't align with her values like she had um, originally intended. That would be an instance where you might regret your purchase, but you can make change. You can identify what the problem is and rectify it. And then overspending is a common unhealthy consumer behavior, but addressing what is the underlying um, factors for impulse spending or what contributes to regret purchases can help with um, understanding overspending and addressing it. So those are just things that we wanted to, to know. It's not all going to be solved with mindfulness or reflection. Sometimes you need outside intervention to help you with 
addressing unhealthy consumer behaviors. Um, when it comes to coping with these more chronic unhealthy consumer behaviors, again, mindfulness can help address some of the money shame. Counseling can help with problem behaviors, modifying behaviors. Mental health treatment may be needed to address underlying factors. For example, um, people with ADHD struggle a lot with impulse control, not just with financial, but with all kinds of things. So making sure that you're addressing that underlying condition can help you be more well in all areas of your life. And it's again, important to acknowledge that financial choices are influenced by lots of factors, not all of which can be controlled by the individual. So we mentioned earlier, sometimes it's related to your environment. Maybe you're in a food desert, you want to make healthy choices, but you don't have access to fresh produce because you're in a food desert. So again, we want to acknowledge that. It's, it's um, financial choices can vary significantly from person to person in situation to situation. All right, just to summarize, uh, in order to kind of think about how your spending can change the world, you want to assess what your values are so you can make sure to spend your money intentionally. It's important to acknowledge that both values and ethics are often intertwined. You want to remember that your financial choices do have power, but they can be limited based on what you have access to. Um, SRI and ESG investing concepts can support change. Understanding them is, is a, a valuable part of your investing strategy. And mindfulness, practicing mindfulness can support healing from money shame and engaging in behavioral change that will help you accomplish your goals and align your behaviors with your values. So we talked a lot about mindfulness today. There are a lot of resources that we put in the chat related to mindfulness, and here they are in the slides. Um, I also wanted to point out that we are going to have a health insurance webinar on April 12th. So that's just in a couple weeks, if you want to sign up for that. And the Illinois Department of Insurance is going to be co-hosting that with us. Uh, you can also watch previous webinars on our YouTube channel, and that's also where we will be posting the recording for today's webinar. So hopefully we'll get that up before next week, but we will email anyone that has registered for this webinar as well. And then you can stay in contact with us through lots of different means. So there are many uh, contributors to the Get Savvy series, and we have them listed here. And we also have dropped in the chat um, some ways to stay in contact. So we'll stay on for a couple more minutes to answer any questions that you might have. But if you have somewhere to go, if you have things to do, that is fine. We will make sure that you get the recording if you have already signed up um, to register for this event. So thank you so much for joining us today. Feel free to head off to your next thing. But again, we appreciate you joining us for today's webinar.